Y'all planning for this? Welcome back to PR Nation. This is Jamie Shalansky in an episode of Worlds to Conquer. And in this four-part series, we are going to be talking about how we onboard new clients. So the transition from when you are a prospect to when you are a client. And last week, we really uh, dove in and talked about setting expectations with prospects. We talked a lot about how our relationship managers handle uh, speaking with prospects about our schedule, how they can get in, when they can get in to see financial advisor. And of course, at our RIA, Shalansky and Associates, we charge for our initial prospect meeting. So how does the relationship manager collect that fee? What are those fees? And what do we deliver to those prospects uh, for that fee during that initial consultation? And this week, what we're going to unpack on this episode is what we expect prospects to give us prior to that initial conversation with them, uh, what we go through in preparation for that initial consultation meeting with a prospect who we hope is going to become a new client. And then we will wrap it up with what our deliverables are, because if we're charging $500 to $1,500 for a consultation, what does the prospect anticipate to get out of that meeting? And do we apply it to their regular ongoing financial planning fees? Do not forget that during the month of October, we are talking all about onboarding brand new clients. As always, we are going to start with basics and basics is wrapped around our terminology. And this is really important to understand. You as the financial advisor might pick up on this very quickly, but you'd be very surprised if your team does not understand the definitions of these words. So prospect and client. A prospect is somebody that we want to do business with potentially, or they think that they want to do business with us. And a client is somebody that has hired you for a service. So in order for somebody to become a client, they have to first sign some type of agreement. They have to agree to engage with us. Uh, Because we charge for our initial consultation, they sign a one-page contract that says, hey, we're going to have this hour-long conversation. Here's what it entails. Here's what you're entitled to. Here's our guarantee of providing value during that uh, consultation. And here's the cost of what it takes to in order to meet with one of us. So First, we start with an engagement agreement of some sort. Ours is a one-page contract. If you become a full-fledged financial planning client, we're going to have a much longer extensive contract defining the scope of our relationship. The second element to become a client is that there has to be an exchange of money. So there are two elements that define a client relationship for our firm, and that is one, an agreement that something is going to be done. That's our one-page contract or our larger financial advisor agreement for people that want full-fledged financial planning throughout the remainder of the year. And then second of all, an exchange of money has to happen. And so that is somebody either paying for a consultation, they're paying for financial planning fees, or they're transferring assets and now are going to be charged an asset under management fee. And this is really important to understand because a lot of financial advisors, we kind of have these weird hybrid practices. Not everything is identical, especially if you've been in business for a really long time. So in our RIA, we are fee and AUM. And that means that we charge a financial planning fee for developing the financial plan, our retainer for maintaining it, and having more extensive conversations outside of just talking about investments. Now, we also charge an asset under management fee for investment management of a portfolio. We do not do insurance only clients. So if you only have annuities or there's only um, some IUL, UL, VUL product out there and that you want us to manage it for you, uh, we don't do that in our RIA. Uh, Maybe you do that as a successful financial advisor. What we have found is that we work best when we are 100% involved and not 10% involved. Um, Anytime that we've done any type of one off where we said, okay, sure, you only want me to manage X, I'll do that. It just doesn't work for us. We're all or nothing. Uh, Same thing when we meet with a couple that maybe manages their finances separately and they say, hey, you know, I'm the husband in this relationship. I'd really like to hire you. Uh, My wife's not involved in the finances. I make all the decisions. Can we go ahead and move forward? Um, And then my cheeky response to that is that I'm not the other woman in any situation and I won't be that person that's involved in your finances without your wife participating also. And same 
same thing goes for the women that just want to meet with me and they make all the decisions in their household. Um, I tell them the same thing. I'm not the other woman in any situation. Your husband has to come to this table. And one of you can be the decision maker, but both of you have to be committed to this. You both have to buy into the financial planning. Otherwise, it's just not going to work for me. Now that we've defined what a client is versus a prospect, and a prospect is somebody that wants to meet with us, they just want one-time advice, they want to see if we're a good fit, and we want to see if they're a good fit for us in return, right? Just because somebody is willing to hire you doesn't mean you should take them on as a client. Listen to your gut instincts. Listen to those red flags when they come up in a meeting. Generally, my red flag is when somebody starts hitting me up on returns and asking me what I guarantee, what's my average portfolio run all of those like red flag questions because I believe that if you live by the markets, you will die by the markets. And if somebody is only interested in who's going to give them the greatest rate of return possible, then they're missing the larger concept for me, which is the comprehensive financial planning. So just because somebody wants to hire you doesn't mean that you should take them on as a client. So when a prospect calls our firm or emails or uh, tags us online and asks for an appointment, uh, our relationship managers are going to hyper gear and they are going to start tracking um, every interaction that they possibly have with that prospect. I want to know where did they come from? How many times did they contact our office to get an appointment? Did they contact us through a web form? Did they email us? Did they uh, go through a referral? option? Uh, how? What is that source that they came from? And we track that top of the funnel because I want to know what's working in our marketing. Where should we put the most amount of energy and dollars? And then also, where's where are we neglecting? Um, last year in uh, 2021 and tw- in the beginning of 2022, we had a flood of prospects come into Shalansky and Associates. We were getting tons of requests, um, unrealistic numbers, um, which is fabulous. What a great problem to have. But just recently at our summer leadership meeting with our lead relationship manager, uh, we sat down and we started talking about where they're all coming from. And then our operations team pulled the new client log and we discovered that we had only had two referrals in the last year on board as new clients. Now, as a financial advisory firm, we normally get probably 12 to 15 solid client referrals every single year. But all of a sudden, we had stopped getting client referrals because we stopped asking. We had this other valve of marketing turned on, and it was providing such a wealth of opportunity for us that we completely neglected to be cultivating those referral relationships. And Oftentimes, your centers of influence, your clients won't exactly know how to refer other people to you. And that's something we do a lot of coaching with our centers of influence and our clients around. But when we took our foot off of that gas pedal, we completely neglected our source of referrals. And it showed statistically on our report. So it's one thing that we want to make sure that we're keeping our eye on the ball, but also what else is happening on the court? What areas are we neglecting um, that maybe we need to put a little bit more energy or at least a a balanced amount of energy towards. So they'll hit that top of the funnel. And then I want to know how long does it take before they do uh, one of two things. In order to get on our calendar, they have to sign, a prospect has to sign our one-page agreement for the consultation. And then second of all, they have to pay up front. Now, we have a 100% value guaranteed um, promise that we make to prospects. So if you pay for your appointment and you feel at the end of the conversation talking to one of our financial advisors that you did not get value out of that meeting, then we will 100% refund that, period. No problem. Do we sometimes have to refund people? Yeah, absolutely. It's an ambiguous question. Do we provide you with value? That's completely subjective. It's a yes or it's a no, and it's in your personal opinion. Um, Since I've been doing this, I've only ever had to refund two people. Uh, One of them was my choice. Um, We ask for a lot of information, which we're going to dive into here in just a moment from a prospect. And when we called, um, it was a telephone appointment. They live in a remote village. And we said, great, how can we be of help to you. And she said, I don't know. I gave you all my information. How can you help me? Um, And then as we began to ask questions, she gave us monosyllabic answers. It was yes or no. Uh, Really couldn't get a lot out of her in this conversation. Uh, So when we wrapped it up, we went through our best, you know, sort of blind financial planning since she wasn't giving us anything and said, hey, based on everything that you delivered uh, for, for your prospect appointment, here's what we see. Here's the areas that you need to work on. And then we wrapped up that meeting asking if it was a value. She said yes. 
I didn't feel like it was. We refunded the fee uh, because I want to sleep at night and I and I knew that appointment was off. We just weren't connecting. So it can happen. It can happen to the best of us. And that's okay, right? We want to make sure that we're delivering high quality uh, consultations, high quality meetings. We're answering questions. We're delivering massive value. And if we fall short of that, we have a choice. We can either 100% refund the fee. Um, they can switch to a financial advisor. Or we can just say, you know what? This meeting, we didn't really get accomplished everything I wanted to. So let's go ahead and have that second consultation. It rarely happens, but when it does, I want to know how I'm pivoting and where I'm moving to. So now let's dive into everything that we ask a prospect to bring us. And this really goes into almost the first two meetings that we have with someone. So we have that prospect meeting and that prospect meeting, as Micah Shalansky probably shared with you for our RIA Shalansky and Associates, it is a no sell sell. And this is really, really difficult for a lot of our old timers out there that are constantly in that uh, aggressive of sale mode, we have to flip it. And it's the no sell sell is that by delivering so much value during that 60 minutes that we're going to spend together and answering all of the client questions, I'm not going to pitch the prospect. In fact, if I do my job right, and I have absolutely inundated them with value, then they're going to ask me, how do I continue to work with you? So in our office, we call that the no sell sell is that you're going to deliver so much value. But by the end of that consultation, they are going to ask you how they can give you money to continue to work with you because they've just been so overwhelmed by value. We ask for a ton of information during our initial consultation with a prospect. Uh, we almost always get the information. Uh, sometimes we'll get a prospect calling in a panic and saying, wow, I really underestimated how much information you guys needed before my appointment. Do you think I should reschedule? Our relationship managers have a really great script for dealing with that. If a prospect does not give us all of the information that we request, we will absolutely still have that appointment. But we also have the opportunity to put a little bit more responsibility on that prospect that we did ask them for a lot of things um, that they didn't deliver to us. So our relationship managers will verbally go through the list and then we will also send them a written list of everything that we're looking for. And we'll do a one page summary that says, hey, we know we want your leave and earning statements. We want the last three years taxes. We want um, statements for all investment accounts that you have. We want copies of your uh, state planning. So that could be your four state planning documents, which is your advanced medical health care directive, your durable power of attorney, your last will and testament and potentially trust if you have one in place. I also want all your employment documents. So if you're working for a corporation and you have a benefits package, I want all of that too. Um, so as you can see, this is a tremendous amount of information that we are putting an onerous on the prospect to deliver us ahead of time. And then also we're going to give them what's referred to as our personal financial fact finder. And that personal financial fact finder, I absolutely love because uh, we were dealing with a business coach one time and he said, okay, give us everything that you ask a prospect for. So we gave him everything we asked a prospect for. And uh, I think it was the first time he ever had a list this extensive because he ended up coming back to us and said, are you kidding me? Um, who really gives you this information? And we said, you know, probably the high 90 percentile of people that, that request a meeting with us are going to give us almost all of this information. And he, and he scoffed and he said, I would never fill all this information out. I would never give it to you. And we were like, well, great, because you're not our ideal client. We would never hire you. We would never let it work with you anyway in that capacity. You're a great business coach. You would not be our ideal client. It's 100% acceptable that you wouldn't fill out this information. We wouldn't ask you to in the first place. All right. So now here's what we're going to go through on the personal financial fact finder. I'm going to walk you through all the different sections of information and you can take notes on the information that we're asking for. And remember, when we're going through this personal financial fact finder, a couple of things that we're setting the tone for with our prospects that we hope to become clients is what we're going to do during this analysis. And during this analysis, we're going to see, are your assets properly positioned, right? Uh, what is your present method of savings? And what is it going to take to maximize it to hit your uh, long-term retirement income goals? What's your pre-tax and after-tax strategy, right? Because we were really big on having a five to 10 year tax plan. Okay. How much capital are you going to need in order to feel comfortable for retirement? What kind of savings and investments are you going to need to hit your goals before retirement, right? We're comprehensive financial planners. We want people spending money today, but not impending them from their goals tomorrow. Um, how much do you need to set aside each month from savings and investments? What's the impact on inflation going to be over the long term for your savings and investments? What kind of tax advantage investments are best suited for your particular needs? Uh, what type of monthly income 
income are you and your family going to need in the event of you or your spouse predeceasing the other or both of you doing that? And then, of course, we'll look at long-term life and disability insurance and make sure everything's properly positioned. So we'll give them this personal financial fact finder. And it is, I believe, about 11 pages long. And it goes through different sections. So in section one, I'm going to ask for their family data. And this is all of their pertinent 411 information on them, uh, assuming we have a married couple, and then also their children. Um, a couple of things that we do a little bit differently uh, than a lot of other practices is we don't ask first name, we ask first legal name. So we're really big on making sure we are complying to the know your client rules. So we always ask for driver's license or proof of government ID. And then we make sure that we have the legal name of the person and that matches up. And here we're going to ask just their overall information, right? Um, their age, their sex, their, you know, education levels, all of that sort of know your client. And then we're going to ask about the children and we're going to say, are they adults? Are they dependent? Where are we at? Are we saving for college and not? Uh, then section two, we're going to dive into their personal information. And this is occupations. Who's working where and how long have they worked at those different places or are they already retired? And then we're going to also talk about their um, current centers of influence. Are they working? with accountants, attorneys, other financial advisors? Are there other people on their team that we maybe need to position ourselves to bring in? And then we'll dive down into section three. Um, section three is going to be their employer benefits. So what type of benefits do they have? And this is all a questionnaire, right? So this is twofold. Everything on this questionnaire, I'm asking them to review their information and make selections. Um, what do you have, you know, uh, for client A and client B? Um, now, also, I'm going to ask them for copies of those documents too, right? And it's redundant, but we'll go a little bit into why in just a moment. In section four, I want to know the retirement objectives, right? When are we anticipating retirement? Do you plan on working part-time in retirement? Talk to me a little bit about those goals. All right. And then um, sometimes for my younger clients, especially my millennials, that they might uh, scratch out on the personal financial fact finder. And instead of saying retirement, they say financial freedom. And they're giving me those target dates. Most of them are choosing age 55. And that's because they've had it, most of the time when I have a prospect or a new client choose to be financially free by 55, they've lost a parent before before that parent was able to retire. Um, so we get a lot of value around money and why that matters so much to them. Section five, we're gonna go into the cash reserve details. Where is your money? And I want to know how many savings accounts they have, if they're mattress stuffing, if we've got, um, you know, silver coin in the um, gun safe at home, where are all those bank accounts? Um, as you know, we take all of this information and we dump it into our custom um, CRM called Infinity, and we track every single one of these fields inside of Infinity for our value add reports that we run regularly for clients. And we do track um, bank information. Right now it's static fields, so we're just relying on the client to give us a statement and then their input of what these different account values are. We don't use any account aggregation software at this time. Uh, we used to um, use Cash Edge and a few other products, but we ran into a lot of dual um, factor authentication issues that just made this more cumbersome for clients to keep up on than it did deliver value to them. So if you're using something, hit me up at lifestyle@theperfectra.com. I would love to know what that is. I'm always looking for strategies about how we can um, enhance the level of value that we're providing to our clients. All right, section six, uh, we dive into different investments. Now, here's what's key. Here I ask you to fill out all the different types of investments you have. You have a SEP, do you have a TSA, a 403B, a 401k, a mutual fund, a money market, you know, give me everything and handwrite them out and tell me whether or not you have a statement and what type of account it is. And this is imperative to me because I'm not relying on the client to have an accurate account value, account named, account description on the personal financial fact finder. Instead, I'm doing something different. I'm seeing what the client thinks that they have, and then I'm going to go compare it to the statement of what they actually have. If you have been in business for a few years as a financial advisor, you know that a lot of times it's not what clients know, it's what they think they know that isn't so, right? And a lot of times clients will tell me, oh yeah, I have a Roth account, no problem, I've been funding that for a really long time, and I'll pull it out, and it's not a Roth, it's an IRA, right? Um, they might think that they have a 401k, but maybe they've been investing in a deferred comp plan instead, and it's a 401a, and they got it confused. Um, you know, so there are all of these different things that clients think that they have 
that may not be so. And I see this most in our next section. And section seven is going to talk about present life insurance. And here's where I see one of the most egregious mistakes is that a lot of times prospects will think that they have adequate life insurance, which of course, all of us out there, you know, how much is enough? It's almost never enough, right? If you're dealing with a widow or widower. But a lot of times, especially those millennial clients will enroll in employer-sponsored life insurance and think that they have adequate insurance in, in place. I see this a lot with my union workers, particularly IBEW. I see it in some healthcare also, um, that the life insurance that they roll, enroll in will be accidental death and disability, which is so ambiguous. Um, I get the logistics of the policy, but I have sat there with medical coroners and have told me that in order for them to determine whether or not something is an accident is subjective to the person that's the physician that is making the decision on the death certificate. I have two examples here. Um, I lost um, uh, my grandpa after surgery um, in recovery. He had a heart attack and they marked it on his um, on his death certificate that it was an accidental death because he accidentally died as post-surgical. Um, then I had a cousin uh, who was married to a man who was um, a lineman and working on the electricity pole, ended up touching something a little hot had a heart attack, fell off the pole and died. And it was not ruled an accident. It was a death via heart attack for natural causes. So I'm a good fan of supplemental insurance being accidental death and disability, but not being your primary case uh, for insurance. So um, I know a lot of you out there probably have tons of insurance experience. You've seen the gamut of different things that can happen here. This is one area that, you know, financial advisors, we know a lot about, but we get a little shy because the public expects us to be insurance salesmen. Um, and that's not really the value that we're trying to deliver. But we want to make sure that this is an area that is taken care of for people. I also see it a lot in long term health care, uh, particularly people that are involved in big church programs that they'll get a long term um, health care plan in place um, that they think is going to adequately provide for them for the rest of their life and may provide around $40 of value when long term care averages two to $300 a day in value. So want to make sure we really watch that. Section eight, we're going to talk about variable annuities and variable life insurance details. And we're going to get a little more information there. Section nine, we're going to drop down to employer monthly benefit for pension details. And this is for any individuals that have some type of defined benefit plan with their employer. And we want to know when they're eligible. And we also want a good working history because sometimes um, people have breaks in service or they leave service or they um, might later in life go back and return to. We see this a lot with school teachers that just get burnt out and they go do a different career. And they're just shy of having vested inside of some type of pension plan. And we've had an opportunity to do a lot of planning between government employees, um, teachers, and even military. People that get out at 17 or 18 years and didn't get the full career benefit in order to um, position them to get retirement benefits, we've had success in having them go back and take a government job for two years, pound those out, buy back their military time, which counts towards a pension for them. So we like to see those working history to make sure we're optimizing any benefits possible. All right, and then we go to section 10, and this is uh, money owed you. So any um, type of loans that you have, this is normally where we see some adult children that maybe have borrowed monies uh, put inside of here. Section 11, we go down into your real estate portfolio, and I want everything, everything that you own. I want to know about the vacation homes, investment properties, cabins, all of that kind of information. I cannot tell you how critical this real estate portfolio um, is, uh, not because it adds to your net worth, but instead because it's so imperative when we talk about estate planning. A lot of times people um, will have a primary residence and then they'll have an investment property. And those types of properties are pretty easy for adult children to know who's going to get what, right? Um, So-and-so is going to get the primary residence. We're going to sell the investment property. We're going to sell both the primary and investment when mom and dad pass. But it is that cabin. It is that lake house. It is that smaller valued asset that causes the most amount of familia grief. So I like to know about all of those properties, especially so we can get estate planning in place and make sure that we're not causing any family drama after mom and dad pass away. And then we dive into liabilities. What do they owe and who do they owe it to? Um, when we do a comprehensive financial plan, I want to know who you're 
borrowing money from? And I want to know what interest rates. And, you know, we like to have a really strong relationship with bankers and credit unions. And if other opportunities pr um, present themselves where they can maybe refinance or do something differently, we're going to recommend that they do so. I'm also really good into cash flow spending plans. Um, I don't call it a budget because a budget's like a diet and we're all going to break it. It's a cash flow spending plan is the language that I use. So a lot of times when I ask for those auto loans, we'll have that payoff date and some type of exclamation written on the form because somebody's really, really excited about that. And then I'll come in and burst their bubble and tell them that even when the car is paid off, we're going to keep making fake car payments to a car account because the second you pay off your car, inevitably something goes wrong with it and you have to repair it. And then you're like, wow, do I spend $2,000 repairing my vehicle or do I just trade it in and spend $50,000 upgrading the model? So if we have that car account, then we've got a little flexibility that you can make a decision that you can um, continue to repair your vehicle or you can use it as a down payment. So we have a lot of cash flow spending ideas that come out of this and we want to be able to make sure we're capturing all of those liabilities. Okay, as we near the bottom of our uh, financial fact finder, we're going to go through the income data. So this is uh, salary and wages and bonus compensation and deferred compensation plans. And we want to know all of the ways in which you and your spouse get money. Section 14, we drop down to income taxes. And I want to know um, what they have filled out on their tax return. Now, I'm also going to ask them for three years worth of tax returns, right? But I want them to go through that tax return and sort of mark these different different areas that may apply to them so that they can have that reinforced value. A lot of what we do in financial planning is around developing that five to 10 year tax plan. And the more that clients become aware of what they either know that isn't so or what they don't know so we can become we can educate them the more value we're able to deliver in our relationship and then section 15 we get anticipated future income uh, this is the area that cracks me up the most because this is where somebody always puts you got it anticipated inheritance so i see a lot of anticipated inheritance here um, but unless i'm working with mom and dad and i know their estate planning um, i really def deter the children from recognizing and anticipating anticipated future income as an inheritance because I have seen a lot of estate planning documents that exclude the children from getting as much as the children think that they're going to get. So unless I know that for a fact, we exclude it as part of our financial plan, but we just put it on our horizon as something to know about. Um, one of the good things on the anticipated future income side of things too is if you have a farm family, you work with a lot of people that have um, farmlands that stay in the family they'll kick out K-1s and normally you'll be able to see those um, here as well. They'll report that farm income coming in. Section 16, we talk about the uh, survivor needs. So what are we most concerned about um, if our spouse had a financial hardship? And this is where you get to divulge all of those fears, right? My um, spouse is a spendthrift. My spouse is handicapped and isn't able to get around if I'm not here to take care of them. So all of those different uh, survivor needs that you want to make sure your financial advisor is aware of, I want them inside of here so that we can make sure that we're developing a financial plan that incorporates and addresses those fears. Section 17, we're going to jump down to monthly cash flow. And uh, this is where you can use that word budget. Uh, for those of you that meet Matthew Jarvis in uh, person at a conference, he is allergic to the word budget. Uh, he says it bouge, so you'll have to ask him about his thoughts on bougies uh, if you see him in person. So in that monthly cash flow, again, I don't call it a uh, budget. I call it a spending plan for people. And I want to know what their income is. How much are they bringing in on a net basis? And where is the money going? I can also discern pretty quickly that if a client totals up the monthly um, spending plan for themselves, that they're pretty good at tracking where their savings and where their money goes. If they leave that total blank, then I know that we have some self-awareness about spending habits that we don't want to address. So if they don't have a total down at the bottom of that form, then I know that we're going to have a conversation about um, making sure we have disciplined spending habits in place. If they do total it up, I know we're going to have a really easy segue into talking about savings. Uh, section 18, we talk about other insurance. This is where we're going to capture the disability, uh, long-term care insurance, auto insurance, all of those details, um, renter's insurance, everything inside of here. 
And in section 19, we're going to um, come to almost the conclusion uh, talking about the estate planning. What do you already have in place, if anything? And so we'll ask you about those four documents. And we'll also ask you about uh, if you have Q-tip trusts, um, annual giving trusts, charitable trusts, all of those more intricate um, levels of trusts as well. Uh, then we'll ask the date that uh, it was last done, if you have uh, any questions regarding it. Next, we'll segue into investment attitudes and risk tolerance. And so here I'll do my due diligence of making sure that I check mark those risk tolerance for uh, clients, which is a giant industry joke, in my opinion, because when markets are high, clients are risky, and when markets are low, clients are conservative. But sure, we'll ask them to rate this because we don't have a better solution for helping to identify risk. All right, then section 21, we will go down to retirement goals. And then this is telling me, all right, how much do you want? What do you, what are you going to bring in? What do you really want to spend? What do you want to do when you're in retirement? And then we'll ask them to finish out the uh, financial fact finder by giving us the retirement priorities and other goals and say, all right, what, what are you, what's important to you? Is it gardening? Is it advanced education? Is it traveling? Uh, is it purchasing boats or airplanes? Where do we want to spend the most amount of money when we go to retire? And then of course, we'll ask them, we'll finish the document um, asking them for any questions that they have. And we'll give them the checklist of attached documents that they need to make sure that they include um, inside of their prospect folder. We use an online system called Box.com for the transfer and share of information. Box allows you to encrypt information and share it back and forth. So it's a really secure place that we have found that uh, we push all clients. Uh, we also deliver client information through Box.com because the way that you deliver information to a client is the way that they will return that information for you. For example, if I had my operations team send a blank account form uh, for a client to complete via email, that client will fill out that account form and guess how they're going to send it back to me. They're going to send it back unsecured via email because the way that I sent the client information is the way they're going to return that information to me. So we push all individuals to use box.com um, in order to share securely information. And then we're going to ask them to attach statements. I want their income, so their pay and leave uh, statements. I want their taxes. Um, minimally, the last two years, ideally the last three, so I can see ebb and flow of income. I want any retirement account statements. I want all insurance declaration policy pages. And then um, any additional items that they want to make sure that we have purview to, as well as estate planning documents. Do prospects give us all of this information? Yes. Yes, they do. They have paid for a meeting. They really want help in talking about their finances. They're going to give us all of the information possible to give them ed educated opinions. And most of the time, we have prospects tell us, thank you so much. I've been meaning to get all of this together for a really long time. Nobody's asked me to go through this exercise. This was really helpful. So yes, prospects definitely give us all of this information. Anything, if they were unable to get a statement or they didn't have a leave and earning statement, um, generally it's the pay stub that comes in a little bit later if we hit them right between pay periods. They may give us their last, but a lot of times people say, hey, I get paid in three days. I was going to wait and give you my most current one. If a prospect does not give us all this information, will we still have the appointment? Yes, of course we will. But our relationship managers will sculpt that conversation saying, hey, listen, you know, we asked for all the supportive information information. You were not able to get it to us for whatever reason, uh, but we're happy to answer your questions during that meeting. And normally when we set that tone, you'll find that um, prospects are a lot more compassionate to you not being able to answer something because they didn't provide something. They understand the rules of engagement for having that meeting. And that part of that was getting all this information and delivering it to us. We can also discern a lot about a prospect by how much information that they're able to give us prior to that meeting. And then we can take their list of questions. So one of the things in order for uh, prospects to meet with us is that our relationship managers are going to ask them, great, what kind of questions can we answer for you during that meeting? How do we deliver the most value? What are you hoping to get answers to during your consultation? And we'll get a list of questions. Normally, no more than five. I mean, sometimes we'll have a lot more, but normally it's about five questions. And those five questions, they have just armed us with the ability to answer during that consultation. So instead of us as financial advisors saying, I don't know, it depends. Well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Now we have the information. Now we can pull up the statement. We can look at their pay stub. We could say, hey, listen, I know you thought you were maxing out your 401k, but actually you're only maxing the employer contribution percentage of 4%. The actual value that you can put inside this account is X. What do you think about Y? 
Now, asking for all of this information also does a few other things. One, it gives our team an entire leg up on uh, getting all of the information inputted into our system after they've become a client. It helps with the onboarding process. And then if that person chooses to hire us through our no sell sell, then we can begin building that financial plan because they've given us all of this data to get started. Now, if they're missing information, which oftentimes happens, they'll get us most of it um, inside of that box.com file. But if they have neglected giving us uh, information in some area, once they've decided to hire us and move forward, they will say, oh, by the way, I will go ahead and go get X, Y, and Z. Or maybe our relationship managers will say, listen, you gave us everything but your last three years taxes. How can we facilitate making that happen? And prospects are expecting it to take a lot of time for you to go through their information and build a financial plan because they just went through this exercise of getting gathering all of that information. So they already know how laborious it is to gather all of those documents and give them over to someone. And they want you to take your time going through and giving them an educated opinion or advice on the information that they've provided. Now, when I finish prospect appointment and we're moving on to the onboarding of a new client, I will always ask them if this was a value and what other questions they have. By the end of the meeting, they will normally tell me, I think that's it. I think you've answered everything. This has been very valuable. Nobody's given me this information before. Thank you so much. I will get some sort of segue like that. And then I say, Mr. and Mrs. Client, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but anytime I'm at the doctor's office and the doctor says, do you have any any more questions. I say no. They stand up. They touch that doorknob. And all of a sudden, I've got 50 other questions I forgot to ask them. Mr. and Mrs. Client, I work with a lot of doctors as a financial advisor, and we call this the doorknob rule. So in our office, we call it the parking lot rule. As soon as we conclude our meeting, your feet are going to hit that pavement, and you are going to think of all of the questions that you did not ask us during this consultation. And when those arrive, I want you to email them to, and then I give them the email address that's not my email address, but goes to our relationship manager inbox. And when you have those questions, I'm more than happy to follow up and give you that information. Now, if they are a prospect and we have concluded our appointment and they have a lingering question, if it is a quick question um, about something that was discussed or said in the meeting, I will normally answer that. If it is a complicated question and they need more financial planning advice or they want a follow-up of some sort, then that's a second consultation that's either a fee or them onboarding as a client. Uh, we don't just sit here for a one-time consultation fee and answer your questions indefinitely for the rest of time. And our relationship managers are empowered to know how to handle that with prospects. If it's a quick question based on something that happened uh, during that meeting, um, something we said, maybe they miswrote a note or forgot what they needed to do, we'll go ahead and answer that really quick for them. But if they want continued financial planning advice, then they need to become a financial planning client. All right, this podcast is 100% about action items. It was super long because I wanted to walk you through everything that we go through when we talk to our prospects and we move them to the onboarding stage of becoming a new client. And again, a prospect is somebody that thinks they want to do business with you or you think you want to do business with them. But there has not been an exchange of money and there has not been an agreement set forth. Once we have an exchange of money and agreement, that person becomes a client. In our office, we practice the no sell sell, which means we deliver so much value in that financial planning meeting that we have the prospects ask us how they continue to work with our firm on an ongoing basis. And we always listen to our gut instincts. If we have a red flag, if we don't like how the conversation is going, you do not have to allow everyone who's willing to hire you to hire you. Prior to ever meeting with that prospect, we ask them for a host of different information so that our financial advisors can be prepared during that consultation to review their questions and give answers. On average, it takes a financial advisor about 30 minutes to one hour of prep time prior to that meeting uh, to go through all of the client questions and make sure that they are prepared for it. But that really depends on the caliber of the financial advisor and how they process information and like to prepare 
care for appointments. Uh, this can take 10 minutes of time. This can take an hour of time. If it takes more than an hour of time, you need to stop and because they have not fully hired you as a financial uh, planning client and in that prospect relationship. So making sure that you're really intentional, you don't play office, you don't get the head trash about, oh my gosh, I don't know how to answer this, but you're really going through the questions, looking at the information that they provided and delivering value right off the get-go. Um, during that consultation, we wanna make sure that we are answering their questions, even if we are bursting at the seams with things that we wanna tell them based on all the information that we just reviewed and all the areas that they need to improve. We close our mouth, we open our ears, and we listen to their questions. They have paid, in our instance, for our time, and therefore we owe it to them to answer their questions first. We will end that consultation with any additional advice or things that we wanted to be aware that they didn't ask questions about. And then we will always ask that prospect, Mr. or Mrs. Client, have I provided you with value today? And if you are asking for this information, if you are listening to clients, if you are practicing that no sell, sell, they will almost always say yes to that question because the information that you have is valuable and is important. And we'll never, ever, ever forget that money is an exchange of value and they have entrusted you to help them in ways that they don't understand the complexity of, they're scared to make a mistake, or their family is so so dependent on them getting it right. You have to provide that level of advice to every person that you meet with. And if you follow this formula that the Perfect RA has laid out for you, then there's no way you can't deliver massive value on a routine basis and radically change lives. Hold on before we go. Something that you need to know. This isn't tax, legal, or investment advice. That isn't our intent. Information designed to change lives. Financial planning can make you thrive. Start today, don't think twice. Be a better husband, father, mother, and wife. The perfect RIA.